So, Professor Homi Baba, thank you for joining us in this in this interview. Um, it's my pleasure, Lynn. Um, I'm only going to use your first name, and I'm going to sure. drop all the honorifics because we're good old friends and uh, share a lot. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So, uh, the context of this um, this interview is is language what we call here language education, which is uh, uh, though our association is called Applied Linguistics in Brazil, we interpret Applied Linguistics not as an application of linguistics, but as linguistics focused on diversity and, and education. Uh, so it's raising consciousness. We, we are very much influenced by the work of Paulo Freire, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so your work has, has been used a lot uh, over the decades. Um, and as we're thinking of uh, at the moment, uh, we're putting behind us this whole concept of the norm in language. I'm looking at how the norm has uh, has been uh, exclusionary and uh, it's ended up with a lot of social injustice, not only for those of us who, are, who teach the mother tongue in Brazil, but those of us who also teach English as a foreign language. So within this whole bundle of preoccupations is also the concept of why is it just English the foreign language? Because our Ministry of Education has recently identified or uh, uh, equated foreign language in Brazil with English. So, uh, you know, we, we think these preoccupations are ours when we are trying to question this, um, um, these uh, last throes of normativism. Um, and your work, especially your, your work, Homi, in, um, in the third space as, as having this translational uh energy in it yeah? so how could you what how could you share your thoughts with us as someone from outside but whose thinking is very much related to this problem um lynn the idea of english as a norm in the context of translationality is really, in, as I understand it, a reflection of the um, power of the language as a bridging language across the world. Of course, there was a time in the 19th century where the, 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 the language of international diplomacy and discourse was French. Uh, that has changed and I think English is now the normative language and, and and from what i understand you saying your government your ministry has identified it as the normative foreign language is that right yes because previously we we had the possibility of teaching spanish and french in our public school systems this has been limited now to english yes <clears throat> And I think when, when Spanish would make more sense for us in uh, in Latin America, right? Spanish would make more sense for you in Latin America, and Spanish would increasingly make more sense for you in the United States. But Spanish would make less sense for you in much of Europe. Mm -hmm. It would make no sense for you, or very little sense, in Russia or in China. Um, uh, it would be completely marginalized in India. Uh, and in Australia, <clears throat> there would be spots here and there. Africa would be lost. So there is a kind of rationale mm -hmm. in having English there, um, given that the other competitor language which is French, uh, you know, uh, at one stage, of course, uh, uh, a, a century ago or more, had, as I said, a diplomatic status. You would think of Egypt, you would think of North Africa, uh, um, uh, uh, you would think of not India, but of course, Europe. 
French would be a translational language. But I think um, uh, in, in that English, uh, it makes sense now. If you, I don't know why you should have only one language. And I certainly don't know why you shouldn't have Spanish running alongside mm -hmm. English. Because I think, as I said, it would be a passport language to the United States in an increasing way. So it seems to me that that is very short-sighted. I mean, I, can, I, I sort of can understand why if you had to choose, you might choose Spanish and English and possibly not French. But I'm not aware as to why they are making these choices and not leaving them up to specific institutions unless that there are many federal funds uh, that are being plowed into this and they had to make some economic decisions, uh, which might be the case. So I'm, I'm not aware of that. However, I all is not lost with English, I think in this role because the king's English or the queen's English has lost its hegemony even in England. BBC English, which used to be the normative English, has also lost its, uh, uh, its, its dominance. There was a time, and I've experienced it myself, that when you um, broadcast or for the BBC, they would they would check your pronunciation and correct it and tell you exactly how certain words should be pronounced. A couple of months ago, I was again on the BBC um, uh, in a in a program on philosophical approaches to pandemic and protest. None of that exists anymore. The BBC News, as you know, emphasizes regionality. So what am I saying? I'm saying I think English is becoming a kind of dialect. And this interests me greatly because I've just written a short piece on Benjamin's essay on translation which I'm about to expand into a larger text. Um, and one of the ideas that I'm particularly interested in, in a passage in the essay where Benjamin quotes a celebrated linguist who says that the challenge of the translator is not to turn Hindi into German, but to turn German into Hindi. Now that may sound like a very utopian idea. And it may also sound less radical than it is. But much hinges on that. Much hinges in the sense of what I have identified as a form of productive, political, progressive hybridization or a third space. Because when when he says the idea is to turn Hindi uh, into German and German into, rather than just turning Hindi into German, but sorry, but to turn German into Hindi, I think he's not talking about supplanting one language with another. He's talking about the uh, supplementation in the Derridian sense, to put something beside it, which emphasizes its difference, which emphasizes the importance of what Benjamin calls in his essay on translation, complementation or convergence at one point in one time without appropriation. Remember, Benjamin talks about the, the, one of his major metaphors or images for talking about translationality, and here I'm thinking about cultural translation as much as linguistic translation, is, he says, the following. The translation emerges not from the life of the original, but from its afterlife. And therefore, he suggests, 
that when you are in the process of translation, you are not only trying to enter the mode of intentionality of another language, but the mode of intentionality of your own language is also being transformed. Translation is a transitional and transformative process going on between languages. And it reveals not only your ability to master another language, but the way another language can de-sovereignize, interrogate your own language, its norms, its cultural assumptions and customs. Which is why he says, to go back to the metaphor I started with, the vessel of translation can only be re-articulated and reassembled because the pieces of the vessel are fragments that fit together because they're complementary, not because they're like each other. And I think that should be a major like motif of thinking about the normativity of languages as always in translation. And I bring this back to your concern about English as the normative language being recognized as the foreign language in Brazil for pedagogical and educational purposes. And I bring in the vessel to suggest that English itself now has had so many afterlives. The afterlife of colonization, the decolonization afterlife, the use of English in a post-colonial domain where it has become dialecticized. It's national sovereignty has been lost. It is not one way to see it is to say it's globalizing. To see it as globalizing is always to see English as hegemonic. But in its globalizing moment, English has become more like a dialect than it is a language. And I was, so I'm writing about this issue at the very moment. So we couldn't be speaking at a better time the only problem is, well, there are two problems. If I had known that we were going to be on this track, I would have sent you um, the short piece that I've just written, which is a foreword to a book written by two Italian professors, very uh, generously indebted to my work. And they've called it The Relocation of Culture. It's being published by Bloomsbury Press in New York and London. And they asked for a foreword. And I should have written a celebratory two paragraphs. It ended up by being the kernel of a piece that I have called Translations Foreign Relations. It's very germane to what you're talking about. And in that piece, um, I want to elaborate the idea that is only a little spark in Benjamin's essay, Unworked Out, where he says, the where he quotes a famous linguistic a, a, a linguist to say after he says that we, the aim should be to make German in, more like Hindi, he then goes on to say, if we do that, then the relationship between languages is, is more like the difference between dialects. And the lesson I draw from that is that comes to me from a, um, a Yiddish linguist who said a language is a dialect, only it has an army and a navy. So denationalizing the normativity of English, turning it into a dialect as has been done in narratives uh, by uh, uh, Rushdie, just to give you one significant example. Um, John Kutzia's last novels, the novels on the refugee condition, are written again in a strange dialect, which is somewhere between English and Spanish. And it's neither. Um, so it seems to me that there is a kind of dialectic of dialect construction within English. And if we only think about it 
um, uh, functionally as a global language, then it becomes oppressive. But if we think now that Irish English, then there is Spanglish, Spanish English, there are so many dialects of English that its normativity through its translation is in a way for us to change and transform. It is not simply a global passport. And it, 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 it is a, it is in a, English is in a process of change. Now, why it should have been English to have had this dominant role says, I think, much about empire. And it says something about the way in which, strangely enough, the English dealt with their empire, which was that they, um, because they, in a way, initially resisted vernacularizing English, they resisted it because they wanted the core of English to be maintained as a differentiating and discriminating ling linguistic register across the across the uh, world so that you couldn't easily be recognized linguistically as being English. You always would be recognized with by your use of English as being a colonial subject living in the midst of what they considered other national languages or other traditional languages to be vernaculars. So it was used as a way of asserting their sovereignty. But language is a wild beast. You cannot control it in that way. And so the wild horses of language galloped right through the empire, produced their own progeny. And today you have, if you look at it progressively, the possibility of turning English into a dialect. That's why I think uh, yep. this could be a productive moment. And I'm speaking off my top of my head because I didn't think we were discussing this issue. But I, I hope it makes yep. some sense. It certainly it makes sense with what uh, has been appearing as a, what, what's being called the English as a lingua franca movement, which began in Europe and now it's very much uh, taking hold in Brazil, where it's basically they're basically saying that we, we are not learning or teaching English as the language of one particular nation or culture, that we're teaching English as we see it and as we need it. Um, now, uh, Homi, uh, this resonates a, a, a lot with uh, your concept of uh, the third space, and you're referring to Benjamin as well. The third space as interstitially productive. So uh, where it's not, you, you have been read as saying, by some as saying the third space is a, is a, a process of production of convergence. But if that's so, then it loses its, um, its interstitial space of productivity. Now, what would you have to say on this? Well, um, I want to come back to the word of convergence. The word convergence is very close to the concept of translation. Mm -hmm. And translation has been crucial in my thinking on the third space. So contradictory as it may sound, let me tell you why I think convergence is not about consensus. It's not about consensus. Building. Convergence is about the recognition of difference but also the recognition of the intersectionality of differences for particular purposes at particular historical moments within particular institutions and operative in specific discourses. So that uh, uh, convergence is not about similarity. It is in fact about the uh, about the uses of difference to create a sense of, of, of coming together 
in order to kinetically create an energy of going in your own way. But the convergence is to me just a very interesting word. To converge means that you come from different places at different times. So there is no originary emphasis here. There is no identitarian emphasis. There is no emphasis of the supremacy or sovereignty of a particular language or culture. Convergence assumes that there is a journey. Convergence assumes that there is displacement. Convergence also assumes that these different temporalities, these different norms and these different values at certain points converge. They come together. Mm -hmm. They come together, why? Because there is a certain political project, because there is a certain linguistic project, because we believe that in translating a particular document with all the issues of the untranslatable ending that we want to create a kind of node or a knot, a knot of knowledge. That knot of knowledge can be made out of various uh, strands, various values, various identifications. But the fact that convergence is a knot assumes that there is no identitarian holism to it. Homi, can I just well, ask you, uh, in this space of convergence, isn't there, politically, ethically, ethically speaking, uh, it presupposes an element of recognition? So. There has to be, you You have to be able to converge with an other or an otherness that you recognize as otherness. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that is, uh, that's obvious. I mean, if I do not recognize your right to be different and I don't simply tolerate that right, I want to identify with it. I want to put myself in the place of alterity and putting your place in the, itself in the place of alterity is not simply this two-handed game of self and other and other and self. Putting yourself in the place of alterity is to begin not only to identify with another, but to look at yourself from another place. Hannah Arendt puts it beautifully. My notion of the knot of convergence is beautifully articulated by Hannah Arendt when she says, there is another inserted into my oneness. That insertion can be painful. That can be strange. That can be incomprehensible. But I have to be open to that strangeness in thinking about convergence. Right. I am not thinking that at the moment of convergence, there is a kind of mirror reflection of sameness and we all become the same. Absolutely not at all. There's nothing originary or identitarian in my view of convergence. So convergence for me, this knot of convergence, this difficult knotting, in order to confront a certain problem, to confront from different directions, to confront fascism, to confront authoritarianism, just to translate it into something very practical, to, to confront racism, to confront Con different conditions of, of, of sexual and gender discrimination. Because under the label of race or sex or gender discrimination, there is not one condition or class. There are all kinds of symbolic, material elements, geographical, historical, traditional. So this convergence is a knot, it's a ganglion. It is, diffi it is difficult to construct and it is also difficult to pull apart. And that is, I believe, at the heart of Benjamin's notion of the constellation mm -hmm. in my reading. And let me give you again from the translation essay, the moment in that essay, which I think speaks to my theory or my concept of convergence. I'm not going to be able to accurately quote it, but close enough. He says, translation is the moment 
when a tangent touches the circle at one point only before the very elements of this touching go on to face their own futures go on to face their own destinies in the linguistic flux have i made it clear yeah. to you yes so what just uh giving a quick deridian reading so we could say you're talking about a knot a knot of convergence with a k and without a k that's right <laughs> that's beautifully put let i always expect these remarkable apesu from you and i'm <laughs> delighted to have this one so uh, uh is that clear how it links into the notion of third space yeah. and translationality have i been clear in my answers to you so certainly, far certainly certainly uh, they resonate with uh, one of our brazilian uh anthropologist philosophers on language i interpret him as philosopher of language perhaps he wouldn't see himself as that i'm not sure if you're familiar with his work eduardo viveiros de castro i'm not familiar uh, uh, so he looks at indigenous uh indigenous philosophies uh, in the amazon region and he says these are perspectival uh cultures where there is no there is no universal or fixed basis for their thinking is it, and it's not relativism it's not different perspectives of the same thing he calls it it's a, a, it's a dislocation of reflection so it's when the subject object relationship is uh is dialogically in place so what is seen as the object by one that object is looking at this the the presupposed subject as a as a subject itself so yeah. yeah i don't know the work i would very much like you to send me something that i might be able to 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 look at because it seems to me to be very interesting but yes the dislocation aspect uh, i think is extremely important yeah. uh, because if there isn't a dislocation of the place of perception of the place mm -hmm. of initial perception if there isn't the dislocation of the grounds of recognition and representation then you can never really have a kind of dialogue you can never you can you can have a dialogue but you cannot have a dialogical exchange based and pivoting around difference yeah great uh for me i don't want to take up your time um, th there one question with uh, a lot of us in brazil are still working on what they call um uh, cultural studies looking at language from a cultural studies perspective uh which is understood here as taking into account language in its uh, uh, ideological so socio historical context what are your what could you say to the, to us about this uh, what's your uh, current take on what was once called cultural studies well <clears throat> lin i have a very brief answer and maybe this will the answer i give you if you and your colleagues can tolerate it might lead to a second conversation before you edit this um this discuss discussion and i would uh, direct you to my lead article in critical inquiry uh, about 3 years ago hmm. or 4 years ago where i take up this I take up uh, they asked me to write a short review of some pieces by Stuart Hall no they have to write a short obituary I forget what it is and I in fact then wrote a 10000 word piece on cultural studies which of course deals it to some extent with Hall but it's much wider than that a particular and important project it turned into something else so could I suggest that we have a, another brief follow up if you wouldn't mind looking at that piece and then posing whatever questions you want on that on the basis of that piece sure and uh, just a last uh, request homie could you um 
your work, your recent work on uh, migration or immigration, yeah. as uh, yeah. as the Europeans like to call it, um, and uh, the how this challenges the uh, the traditional narrative of the nation, uh, and it it, it just it doesn't only challenge it disturbs it, and this I can see this as being related to our uh, our challenging and disturbing the the concept of language as a um, as standard language right um now in this you know you 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 use you mentioned you work on the idea of um, um disappointed hope so in this movement of disappointed hope of the migrants how could would, could you see any parallel between that and those of us who are looking at this process of translation of the once standard English? <clears throat> well, not immediately, but I'm not one to, to duck a challenge. <laughs> and so let me try and think my way um, through this very important question without turning the condition of migration and the refugee into simply a linguistic issue. I don't want to do that. Yeah. So I want to disturb, as you say, the protocols of linguistic or theoretical translation um, with the real life existential phenomenological conditions, political conditions, legal conditions of the migration uh, crisis or migration situation. Uh, yeah, I don't want, I use the word crisis, but it's not advisable because I think governments that ignore their responsibilities yeah. and their, their own acts over long periods of time when they are confronted with the uh, uh, the bitter fruit of what they've done, they throw up their hands and say, we're doing our best we can, this is a crisis. Yep. You know, the migration crisis in Europe, uh, the Mediterranean crisis was a long time coming, but it was put on the back burner, it was ignored, and then suddenly they say, we can't do any better, we are in a crisis. So I shouldn't, I just want to qualify that. But let me, <clears throat> but let me, um, start with something I have just said to repeat it and to get my own foothold in the conversation we've had. So it is, as I said a moment ago, some of the great works of migration and the condition of the refugee, starting with Naipaul's uh, work, uh, uh, The Enigma of Arrival, uh, going through to Toni Morrison's home, which is about discovering the strangeness of the national home and saying, is this my home? In fact, she has a lyric where she says, I have been, I have been abused, I have been displaced, yet why does my key fit the lock of this home that I do not recognize? John could see his novels that I just mentioned, the most recent novels. They are all, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Penny Erpenbeck's great novel, Go Went Gone, which is about the best thing that I've read on the whole condition of the European uh, migration uh, issue, just the very best. In each of these, the issue of translation plays a major role. And I think, to answer your question with a certain brevity, because I could go on at length, which I don't want to do. I think that migration is an illustration, not only of the transition across borders, across frontiers, for various reasons, whether it is um, environmental, ecological, tyranny, um, uh, poverty, um, for all these reasons, migrant lives or the process of migration are translational lives in various ways. 
Let's try and explore these. First of all, there is quite literally the issue of language. To have to describe your own conditions of life at the frontier or in a, my, in a refugee tribunal in terms that actually comply with or conform to the refugee convention or the local legal or whatever the national requirements are is quite literally a translational process and problem. How do I speak that condition in terms of these administrative, legal, and bureaucratic requirements? And here the translator becomes absolutely crucial. And in fact, Valeria Luiselli's book, The Lost Children Archive, is a is based on her experience as acting as such a translator. And then she writes a work which is more generally about the condition uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Central and Latin American refugees and migrants as a translational problem. So first of all, there is a the very material, physical issue. Because as you know, uh, and here I like to bring it back to the to the Refugee Convention 1951, to claim asylum, you have to physically be across the border. That is the, juris that is the jurisdictional issue. You, you have to cross a border and make your claim. That, if you think about it metaphorically, is already to make a certain moment of to create a moment in your life from which to then make your claim from which to then tell your story that is part of this notion of the trans of translation as a process of displacement and transition that's the first requirement of the refugee convention the second requirement is that you have to then constitute your story of your life, your reasons for making this, for making the claim. And you have to satisfy the difficult um, uh, condition, and I know I'm not going to quote this right, of, of proving that you would be persecuted in the future even if you haven't been actually persecuted in the past for the grounds on which you are claiming refugee, religious belief, fear of violence, uh, and, and so on. So in a way, if you think about it, under the heading of what I've called the translation of life and death in the context of migration, the second requirement, once you have crossed the international boundary, which is the geographical demand requirement, the second is a narratological and linguistic one. You have to be able to convince the judge or the counselor, whoever it is, that you have a real and present fear of persecution in the future. Think about the temporality there. Is that not the temporality of translation? Yeah. I have to convince, find the language to adapt to your legal requirements in order to think about the futurity of prosecution. So I think that if you think about translation as an apparatus of transformation, as an apparatus of putting together parts of a, a fragmented life, and if Migration is not a moment of fragmentation of life. What is it? Putting it together into a new vessel of meaning and, 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 and procedure whereby the pieces that will not be the same yet have to have a convergence in the way we talked about it. 
or a certain kind of complementation. So that's one issue. And here, of course, the actual role of the translator who is doing this work, who is the vessel, so to speak, that, that, that is important. Now, of course, so that's one issue. So I want to just, I could go on about this. I could, uh, but let me take just one further moment to address why the translational metaphor, the translational trope relates to the disappointed hope of the migrant. The phrase disappointed hope comes from Bloch and Adorno, and uh, I think it's very important. And again, let me start with the material conditions, the historical conditions, the legal conditions. One of the great jurists of the Refugee Convention said that unless these various countries who are having to deal with the migration situation, the large flows of displaced people, unless they understand that people are risking their lives, they're risking their lives on the basis of a hope of being able to reconstitute their lives, think of the translational process, to reconstitute their lives made up of different cultural fragments, some their own, different fragments of memory, some new, some old. They can never smoothly come together, but they can be assembled as in the Benjaminian vessel of translation. That unless, so this great jurist says, Unless these governments understand that in the moment of death, there is also a moment of optimism in order to see a horizon of hope, of a life being able to be lived with dignity, with prosperity, with rights, then these governments will not understand what they have to do at the policy level. If they keep seeing these people simply as problems, they will never be able to create a legal apparatus or an ethical apparatus that will be able to deal with this phenomenon, which is a phenomenon of disappointed hope, which is a phenomenon of the risk to life very real risk to life, as you know, with the Mediterranean drownings, the risk to life in the hope of life, death in the hope of life. And I think that's a very important way of thinking about the ethics of migration, the ethics of displacement, and indeed the ethics of translation. That's my second point. And I promised you that it would be my last, but I must add a third. In the work I've been doing, I have posed a certain question to myself, which is an interrogation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which followed on from the horrors of the Holocaust, and the horrors of the Holocaust, as we know, was not the only was not only the genocide of the Jews, which was the most flagrant um, um, uh, act of the Holocaust, but there were people from other, uh, 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 you know, uh, people of, uh, of other kinds, uh, uh, gays, gay people, and other other communities, Roma who were also part of this incredible um, um, industrial erasure of people. And the, the Universal Declaration was based on the hope that this will never happen again, never again. Therefore, 
if you read the Universal Declaration, there are no references really to the deplorable history of the Second World War on the basis of which this architecture of universal hope and universal rights was constructed. The metaphor of the, the sustaining metaphor of the Universal Declaration is birth in two important respects. One, by being born as a member of the human family, simply by being born into the human community, you carry with you the right to have rights. You carry with you the seed of the human dignity. So it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter your class status, your gender, your race, just by being human, you have access to this whole architecture of rights. It's about being born into, into the uh, human community. Then there is a second sustaining metaphor of birth in the construction of the Universal Declaration. And that is that by being born human, you are born into a moral universe. That's the second rebirth, that you're born into a universe of moral values. Now, what I'm trying to understand is, instead of the trope of birth, if we rethink the history and the ethical value and the political uh, efficacy of rights from the perspective of what I've just talked about, which is the optimism that takes on the real possibility of death in order to hope, supposing we restructure the Universal Declaration on the basis of disappointed hope that for me has emerged very strongly from the displacement of peoples, then how do we rethink the questions of rights and responsibilities, both as citizens, but also as those who are displaced peoples, over 70 million today, over 70 million, the, uh, the size of a country larger than the United Kingdom, only their dispersed peoples. How do we rethink the notion of citizenship? By unpeeling its rights and responsibilities and looking at the core of citizenship. And I believe that the core of citizenship is the refugee. The core of citizenship is the displaced person. The core of citizenship is the person without security at the ethical core of citizenship. And then in order to avoid that condition, the clothes of the citizen, the appurtenances are put on in order to avoid. It's like the Russian dolls. And I believe at the heart, you take one doll and in the there's another and another, and you take economic rights and social rights and political rights, cultural rights, and you keep moving. All these rights are there to avoid the predicament, ethical, political, phenomenological of the refugee. And so we need now to think about citizenship, not by tinkering with it to make it more hospitable, but by rethinking it, by taking what is the core at, of, of citizenship and seeing it as a kind of commitment, uh, a glow that needs to ignite our sense of history, memory, community, and society. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. This is, this uh, is uh, uh, you're pointing at the blind spot of citizenship, which is uh, where citizenship thinking begins, which is uh, the lack of statehood, right? Yeah. Correct. Thank you very much for this. Um, I think we've run out of time now. Um, all my colleagues here are joining me to thank you very much for your your for accepting to, to speak to us and uh, share 
your thoughts with us. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, homie.